Well, <clears throat> today is a beautiful day of atonement. I mean, it is. Well, it's just a beautiful day. Beautiful day. <clears throat> One of the things that we'll find out today is that atonement is really all about Jesus Christ and the devil. But the battle is worth uh, mentioning. And so the, the title of this message is Atonement, the Many Parts. Atonement, the Many Parts. <clears throat> Why is there no peace in the world? And you all know, actually, if you go through a couple of centuries of world history, you know, intellectuals and different people, oh, we finally got the, the peace of all peace, the treaty that will guarantee peace. Maybe the biggest joke is Versailles Treaty after World War I. Actually, it made things worse. But anyway, whatever you point your finger at, peace will never come to this world. Neither will universal prosperity, order, or any of those positive things. Um, we know the reason is because Satan is loose and has a lot of power. Um, <clears throat> the biblical holy days are a shadow of things to come. Some people look at that and say, well, it's only a shadow. Do you realize a shadow, some translations use the word guideline. But either way, shadow or guidelines. If, if I told you I had a guideline to the future, would you want to know it? Of course you would. That would be a big deal. The holy days are a guideline to the future, a guideline to God's plan. Um, they're a big revelation. So what does atonement tell us of the future? What does atonement tell us? It tells us, number one, as we mentioned a few days ago in the sermon, that soon evil will be locked away. The world will be at one with God. You know, if you think of the word atonement, at one meant, at one with God. The world will soon be at one with God because of the blood of Christ. I actually think the Passover and the Day of Atonement go together. I'm still working on trying to figure out all the reasons how they go together, but it's an interesting thought that on the exact moment, and, and everyone agrees, when um, at the temple the priests were killing the official lamb for the Passover, at that exact moment is when Christ died and gave up the ghost. And he started his crucifixion at the beginning of the morning sacrifice that day and died on the evening sacrifice. And the veil in the temple rent. Now that may explain what the veil is. Most of you know, but just to repeat it anyway. Um, the temple really was fairly simple in its overall design. There was a holy place that had a whole bunch of holy things like bread and, and the pipes and various things and, uh, that the priest did their normal work in. There was a second room called the Holy of Holies, or the holiest place. The priest could only go in there once a year, and only he could go, as, and only the top priest. At first it was Aaron and, and his sons later, but uh, and he only go one day, the Day of Atonement. And there was this big, thick, expensive curtain um, that separated the two. As a matter of fact, this actually is true. I've read in some commentaries. When God was actively involved with the temple, if a priest went in there and did something he wasn't supposed to, God struck him dead. It actually happened to two of Aaron's sons. The details maybe aren't important now, but um, they would actually tie a, ring, a, a rope to the leg of the high priest when he went there when they were worried about it so they could drag his body out because they couldn't go in and get it. You just you don't go in there. Now, there are some other details we, about the people who were in charge of moving and maintenance, but that's another story. Certain Levi's on certain conditions with poles could move it and maintenance it. But even still, it was, it was sacred ground. Moses designed it based on what God told him God's throne looked like. They call it the cover seat on the Ark of the Covenant that was in there, or mercy seat. That seat was supposed to be a model of God's throne. I'm not exactly sure how to picture that in your mind, but... Um, and covered by two large golden cherubims. So, so get that in your mind. So if the curtain that separated the two, that nobody could dare enter, you know, at the risk of your life, was split open the moment Christ died, what does that tell you? 
it tells you that he was fulfilling uh, the role of the atonement as well as the Passover lamb. Now, maybe there's more to it. We haven't quite figured all the details out. And it should have been assigned to the Jewish priesthood as well. Some of them did get converted later on to Christianity. Some of them got it, but most of them refused to see it, which is human nature can be that way. People can be stubborn. We're not going to see it because we don't want to see it. <clears throat> Hard-headed. <clears throat> but everything God says to do makes people happier. And, and when the devil challenged God's running things, the devil, I guess he believes he can do it better, he deserves it more, he's special, however he looks at it. But when, we, when the devil pushes against God's things, he makes people more unhappy. And I believe it's probably true of the angels. For instance, let's take the, a simple law like do not covet. Do you realize that you're happier if you do not covet? Whatever you can say about your life, there are people who are born luckier, born better looking, born stronger, born richer, born with better family connections, born with more natural talent, whatever it is you want. You know what I'm saying. They got the breaks, uh, whatever, whatever the breaks were. The coach liked them and didn't like you. Now, you can be unhappy and covet, but isn't, it, but isn't that good for you? God would just say, make the best of whatever hand I've dealt you and don't worry about what other people have. Uh, <clears throat> being envious is bad. It reminds me of this joke. The man said, you, really, you realize that you don't need a parachute to go skydiving. He said, what do you mean you don't need a parachute to go skydiving? He said, really? You don't need a parachute to go skydiving? He said, really? He said, yes. You only need a parachute if you want to go skydiving the second time. Because <laughs> you're not going to survive the end of that wonderful skydive. <laughs> you, know, you see those guys diving through the sky and go fast, and especially those suits. <clears throat> but if the chute doesn't open at the bottom, oh well. <clears throat> but the devil's ways do hurt. So I'm going to go to Daniel 7.25. I want to read this. This is from the Good News Translation. It adds a little bit more oomph to it than the uh, King James. <clears throat> Daniel 7.23. This is the explanation I was given. The fourth beast is a fourth empire that will be on the earth and will be different from all other empires. <clears throat> By the way, when Daniel wrote this, the Roman Empire wasn't around. And clearly the Roman Empire was different than any of the other empires. And, and in some ways, you know, the Treaty of Rome is what put together the EU. And it is kind of, as Tucker Carlson called it, the new German Empire. It's still there. The Roman Empire is still sort of there. But anyway, <clears throat> just to ask the question, how did Daniel know that centuries before it happened? Anyway, before it even began, it lasted for many centuries. It will crush the whole earth and trample it down. The ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Now, I realize the ten kings haven't come yet, but that's all coming. And you don't know how I know? Because I trust the Bible. It may surprise people what happens, but it will happen someday. Everybody's going to be, oh, I can't believe it. <clears throat> then another king will appear. He'll be very different from the earlier ones and will overthrow three of the kings. He will speak against the supreme God. <clears throat> and oppress God's people. He will try to change their religious laws and festivals. Interesting, and festivals. Um, do you realize that once the Roman Catholic Church got going, uh, and, and most Protestants have adopted this without realizing it, they've adopted the position that God's laws and festivals are done away. Now, I think the, the, the final arrogant uh, beast and his religious leader are going to push the apostasy even further. But, you know, that's what the world says. Most Catholics and Protestants, they may vary on some of the details, but they say the law and the festivals of God are done away. That would include atonement, right? Don't they tell you that? 
That's what they say. <clears throat> and God's people will be under his power. Now, <clears throat> we'll be in places of safety because we're, we're proving to God we're with him now. But those who get converted during the Great Tribulation will face a lot of tough persecution. Um, that doesn't mean they're bad. It just means that's just the way things will work out. They say that God's laws are done away, and then we have to look for clues as to which ones have been reinstated. But I ought to make this statement about the Sabbath. Uh, as we go through our Bible study, we will see the Sabbath mentioned frequently that Paul would say many, many Sabbaths in the synagogue until he's either forced out, or some in Berea he wasn't forced out, but whatever happened, happened. Um, you realize that Christ was raised uh, Jewish. All the apostles were Jewish. And the Gentiles were proselytes to Judaism. That's what God fear means. They sat in the back of the synagogue, but they came to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Everybody was a Sabbath keeper. And it was one of the most, it was one of the two reasons that Judah went into captivity, and they wanted to be sure it didn't happen again, so they, they put a special focus on the Sabbath. I'm not saying their focus was always balanced, but it was there. Now, if Jesus Christ had come along and changed it, shouldn't he have told somebody he was going to change it? Shouldn't there be a discussion as, one, why are we changing it? And two, what are our justifications for changing it? None of that is in the New Testament. They pick a couple, uh, like a going-away party of Paul on Friday night, which technically... By the way, the Bible does this is the first day of the week because the Sabbath ends at sunset as proof. That's not proof of anything. It's just not there. And all that fuss over circumcision, which is relatively minor compared to the Sabbath, the truth is um, the Sabbath, by the fact that they never challenged it, proves it's still in effect. And the annual Sabbaths are still in effect. And we'll go through the book of Acts, and you'll see, uh, even on the book of, on, even on atonement, when Paul is on a prison ship, we assume it's in October, and rough seas on his way, he's under arrest, on his way to Rome. Uh, Luke mentions the fast. Now, why would Luke mention it if they haven't been keeping it for the last 30 or 40 years, right? He wouldn't mention it. He'd mention, well, it's almost Halloween. I mean, I mean if this was, the day, wouldn't he have said that? We're only a couple weeks from Halloween, so the weather's getting bad, right? I mean, that's what, he, I mean, if he were in today's um, modern Christianity, Christianity, isn't that what he would have said, right? He mentioned it because I imagine on a rough sea, fasting <laughs> is tough. Because, you know, the ocean is messing with your stomach. Anyway, <clears throat> but he mentioned it because it's, it's a time marker. Like, we mark our calendar by the feast, Passover, and Pentecost. It's a time marker for us. And it just makes sense. There's no evidence they ever changed. If there's no evidence of a change, there is no change. I really believe that. Um, Ephesians 6.11 Put on the, all the armor that God gives you so that you'll be able to stand up against the devil's evil tricks. But we're not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in high places, rulers, authorities of cosmic power in this dark age. So what are we up against in today's world? We're up against Satan. He runs this world. Or much, have, at least he heavily influences. I don't, see, I don't think Satan makes you be evil. I, that may be an overstatement, but he's there pushing, influencing, watering down, deceiving on a regular basis. So we're going to look at <clears throat> the, the Festival of Atonement. Now this is a spiritual feast day only, not a physical feast day, but it's still a feast day. We're just feasting <clears throat> on spiritual food. Leviticus 23, 1 through 4. And the Lord spoke to Moses, Speak of the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim. I'm going to go to verse 4. 
of Leviticus 23. These are the feast of the Lord, and that Lord could be translated in English Jehovah, and you know some may pronounce it in other words. No, it's the God of Israel. These are his feasts, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their appointed time, in other words, in the seasons. They're not the Jews' holy days. I mean, they're the only ones that keep them in, in a big way, um, and, they, and they ran the festival sites, at least the big ones in the days of Paul, but they're God's holy days, and, and, don't, and that's easy to get confused with. Um, so we're going to go through them and see how it points to the future and, and meaning that we can find. Um, we're going to look at most of the steps that the priest had to go through on the Day of Atonement. Step number one, the priest, there's a certain section behind the, uh, the altar where there's a big basin for bathing, and then they walk up the steps into the holy place. So in that area, um, the priest would bathe, <clears throat> take off his very elaborate priestly garments with all the jewels and stuff, go inside the uh, holy place, and put on a clean, pure linen miter, um, priestly garment and, and had miter underwear as well and, and pure linen uh, white underwear to me the meaning of that is pretty obviously it's pure white and linen doesn't sweat like more other fabrics do if you kind of think of that in, in your mind uh, there are some really good commentaries that have pictures of what it looks like well what's the pure white linen represent it represents the purity of the sacrifice. Who was the pure sacrifice? Jesus Christ was the pure sacrifice. That whole costume thing, because the human being, Aaron, wasn't good enough. He certainly wasn't. He wasn't good enough to be going in holy, holy, making the offering. So he then had to go, you know, out of the um, holy place, out into the art where the um, altar was, sacrifice a bull for himself and then take that, some of the blood of that bull into the, um, this is, uh, into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle some of that blood on the mercy seat. And he's doing this as cover for his sin. He also took with him an incense I'm not quite sure exactly what they looked like. Could have been a box or a thing with a handle, but they put a bunch of perfumes and hot coals and a little bit of water, and they would create a steam of sweet smell and the cloud. The cloud would block him so God doesn't have to look at him so much or maybe protect him from looking at God. And that, and that when he went in there, God would only smell the beautiful perfumes, not his body sweat. Even though he was bathed and wearing linen, even still, he had to do that. That was part of the procedure. You go in there, you have to be pure. Smell, appearance, the whole thing. Uh, and that sinlessness represents Jesus Christ. Step three, uh, as I said, he sprinkled some of the incense uh, and that in there. Step four, he would then go out of the Holy of Holies. Um, <clears throat> out into the middle temple area, they would get two goats. He would cast lots, so like dice. He would cast lots. Um, one lot would tell him this goat uh, represents Satan and this goat represents the goat, I'd say Christ, represents the goat that's going to die for the sins of the people. Leviticus 16, 7 through 9. Leviticus 16. He shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats. One lot for the Lord. Yeah, one lot represents God, Jehovah. Well, that's really Jesus Christ, right? Would you all agree? One lot for the Lord, that's Jesus Christ. You have to go back to John and other scriptures, but clearly... The true God of the Old Testament was Jesus Christ. Actually, it's in several places. Even Paul said Christ was that rock that led the Israelites out of Egypt. You see that in 1 Corinthians 10. And that's maybe another topic, but I want to just emphasize it. 
One lot was for the Lord, and that Lord was Jesus Christ. The other lot was for the scapegoat, or a zazel goat, as some translate it. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. So who died for the sins of the nation of Israel? God himself did. And that's why his sacrifice is so valuable because of who he is. Um, and as we mentioned last week, uh, Satan is our partner in sinfulness. So um, <clears throat> he gets a certain blame. But, let's, but the reason they had to use lots is because we human beings, we can't recognize evil. We really can't. And there's some con men. I was listening to this uh, educational tape. Uh, you know, they I hate to say this, but they're now finding that senior citizens are more easily conned by energetic con men. And some of them have figured out they even call you on the phone. They already figured out my age, so they're calling me. Some of the worst scams, I think, they must think I'm really stupid. It's a scam where they say, we got all this money we want to refund to you. Just please call this number and let us get into your computer. I won't go into all the details. There's several versions of that. I think, man, they must really think we seniors are so stupid. But I guess some people must fall for it. They're spending money to give me money? Now, you think about that. But we really, we people can easily be deceived. And that's why... A lot had to tell them who was the good and who was evil. People can't see it. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 13. For such are false apostles. Yes, there were people running around in the days of Paul pretending to be apostles, and they were, well, all kinds of different devious purposes. Deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ Verse 14, and no wonder, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. I actually don't know how that works, but maybe a lot of things people are doing, they're really worshiping the devil and don't know it. Maybe that's a little hard, to, uh, but at least I think the devil likes being worshipped. I'm not exactly sure how he transforms himself to an angel of light, but the deception is bad and Right near the end, it's going to get worse. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Yeah, if you teach that God's laws and his festivals are done away, um, you're deceived as a minister. But a lot of them teach that, and, and some of them mean, well, I don't want to be too critical. So I'm, you know, not be, I'm just saying... Um, the devil has to see the world. Okay, step number six, more or less. Uh, they sacrifice the goat that represent the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> and then Aaron would go back into the Holy of Holies and put, you know, sprinkle, however he did it, with a brush or his hand or something, sprinkle some of that blood on the mercy seat. And that's similar to the wave sheaf offering. Remember, after Christ was resurrected, um, Mary saw him early that evening, maybe 4 or 5 a.m., and she said, he said to her, do not hold me. Don't hug me. I have to stay pure. I have to go up and ascend to my father. Because the wave sheaf offering, they took the first of the first fruits from Pentecost, and they took it to um, the temple of God, or tabernacle, and later the temple. And they waved that in front of the priest, high priest, as an offering to God. Well, Jesus Christ actually went up to the real God and sat on the real throne of God next to God and was accepted as the offering, first of the first fruits. In other words, what happened at Pentecost was like a stage, a play, and the play was acting out what the real Jesus Christ would do. Does that make sense? In other words, when the priest, high priest, went into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the goat that represented the Lord and sprinkled it, that um, Holy of Holies 
was a representation of God's throne. And he, of course, presented the blood sacrifice of God's throne. Well, Christ presented himself, the real thing, to the real throne. Of course, the Holy of Holies was just a model of it. So I think that's the real meaning of it. Um, <clears throat> step number seven. Then he would go outside and sprinkle some of the blood on the altar. This is the altar that's outside the, uh, the temple building in the Holy of Holies. Number, step eight. Then they would, he, he <clears throat> would put his hands, I assume by the horns, of the goat. That's the Azazel goat. He put his hands on that goat, and he would confess over that goat the sins of the people. Leviticus 16, 21. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, Confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a strong man. And the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land. In other words, he's out there all by himself in a hot, desolate, desert place. Well, that's God's way of saying a good deal of the sin, I won't say all, but the way it's worded, a good deal of the sin of the people is really the devil's fault. If he hadn't been around, a lot of bad things would not have happened. And he's taken his guilt. We read this last week, but I'll just mention it, Revelation 21 to 4. An angel comes, grabs Satan and I assume his demons, throw them into the lake of fire, which... It's like the top of it. Underneath that, it's a bottomless pit. And they sink through that lake of fire into the bottomless pit or where the lake of fire might have been. It might have burned out by then. It's not quite sure, but something like that. I, I picture it in my mind. Trying to picture what the bottomless pit looks like is kind of hard, too. But whatever it is, and then he puts a lock on it. And the devil can't break the lock. You know, God can build a... A pit that the devil and the demons can't get out of because he's God. They're stuck, just like the goat who was all by himself in a hot desert. Said, so what happened? That's a model of Satan being locked up in the bottomless pit. Now I want to tell you a story, but first I want to preface it. This world, by following the devil, he's been making an idiot out of mankind for years blowing up ourselves, killing ourselves, mistreating each other. I could rattle along all the bad things in the world. So here's an idiot joke. This is called Idiot Number One. <clears throat> I'm a medical uh, student currently uh, doing my rotation in the, the poison department, toxicology. Today a woman calls. She's very upset because she caught her daughter eating ants. So I quickly reassured her. I said, look, um, this is just normal, regular ants. They're not poisonous. Your daughter will be fine. Don't worry about it. She says, well, I did sort of take care of it. Because she'd eaten ants, I gave her some ant poison to eat. <laughs> he said, you better rush her into the emergency room right away. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> Well, we would be idiots if we follow the devil any longer. Ephesians 2 1. Ephesians 2 1. And you, <clears throat> he made alive, you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. You know, that's a great title that the devil has, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. I actually have that in a good news translation that's a little more dramatic, the spiritual power that's in space, getting people to obey him. And I think of it, you think of the Internet. Well, the Internet is run by something called Wi-Fi signals in the air. You think of television. It's run by electromagnetic pulses, signals in the air. Same with radio. And a lot of, in other words, who's controlling a lot of the information we're getting? The prince. So are we really surprised? I heard some more scandals about um, P 
people running the internet are purposely sabotaging information regarding what we call positive Christian things and pushing very, very anti-family negative things. But is that any surprise? Who's the prince of the power of the air? Satan. So I, I, you know, I'm sure the, the young guys, most of them are young people that are running the internet, are miseducated by our bad education system, and that's part of the problem too. Um, and, and you know, when you watch a TV show, you ask yourself, what is a TV writer after? You know, Goebbels said the best propaganda is embedded inside entertainment. People don't even know they're being propagandized. Who you pick to be the villain and how you set it up. So when you're watching something on TV, ask yourself, does the writer have any issues he's pushing cleverly? And you do that, and a lot of times you'll find it. You say, yep, I should ignore that, ignore that, turn it off, don't watch this show anymore, or whatever. At least be on the alert as to what they're pushing. <clears throat> um, so be cautious, and that includes literature. Uh, matter of fact, I found that the older sci-fi books don't have a lot of bad words and some bad things in them that newer ones have, less graphic violence. It's like, as time goes on, the music gets more, it used to be the music was about romance. Now it is, well, it depends. I guess I will admit there's still some good music out there, but a lot of popular music is getting in the gutter more, you, you sense it more and more and more. Um, <clears throat> and it's going to be a wonderful thing when Satan is taken away and locked up. This holy day represents Satan getting his due desserts. And that is a big thing. Now it's because of Christ, uh, but still, he's getting his due desserts. Hebrews 9, verse 11. But Christ has already come as the high priest of good things that are already here. So in other words, the high priest that you see and mention Aaron and the other high priest, they were simply models or types of the real thing, which is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the tabernacle in which he serves is greater and more perfect. It's, it is not a temple made by human hands. That is, it is not part of this created world. When Christ went through the temple and entered once and for all into the most holy place, he did not take the blood of goats and bulls to offer a sacrifice. Rather, he took his own blood and obtained eternal salvation for us. The blood of the gold, bull, <clears throat> really, you know, God doesn't really need the blood of bulls and goats. I think blood is red just to show people how bad sin was. But <clears throat> the real deal is the blood of Christ. Jesus went to the real throne of God for all Israelites. By the way, people say, well, well the Day of Atonement was, was to clear the entire nation of Israel of sin. But actually, the whole world will someday be part of, I'll call it, spiritual Israel. Uh, because Paul says, once you become... Christ, you become Abraham's seed. Um, and someday the whole world, because <clears throat> that's what God promised Abraham in the original covenant, that many nations, that someday the whole world will become sons of Abraham. Um, and atonement is about the whole world <clears throat> being at one meant with God. That's what atonement means. <clears throat> you can look at Galatians 3, 8, and 9, and the rest of that chapter in Galatians, you'll see that Paul said that if you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed. So it includes everybody. So Jesus' return is, is modeled by the Feast of Trumpets, the converting of the entire world, or at least the start of it. It might take several years, and you know God is smart, and you know some of the details we don't have to know. It'll probably take several years, but it's the start of converting the whole world. That's the Day of Atonement. And then, of course, the millennial reign of Christ on the, the uh, <clears throat> Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> Hebrews 9, 23. <clears throat> um, those things which are copies of the heavenly originals had to be purified in that way. 
but the heavenly things themselves require much better sacrifices. So he's talking about all the things that um, that, that they had to do, you know, uh, they had to use the blood to purify the altar, to purify the high priest, and to purify the people. And he's saying all those things they did. Uh, <clears throat> but the heavenly things themselves require much better sacrifices. For Christ did not go into a holy place made by human hands, which was a copy of the real one. He went into heaven itself, where he now appears on our behalf in the presence of God. It's even better on that throne in the real Holy of Holies in heaven, Christ is at the Father's right hand running everything, and I assume running the Holy Spirit or managing the Holy Spirit or whatever the thing is, telling the Holy Spirit what to do. And he's there on our behalf, speaking for our benefit. The, the high priest goes into the holy place every year with the blood of animals, but Christ did not go in to offer himself many times. Instead, now when all ages of times are nearing the end, he's appeared once and for all. He only had to do it once. He only had to offer himself once. Jesus covers our sins once and for all. And that's really what was being acted out in the temple. Now, what do we have to do? What we have to do is stay with Christ. Stay in a repentant spirit. Stay humble. Um, there's an old joke about, you know, I had so many successes, it's hard for me to stay humble. Well, that's probably a bad attitude. Um, but, but, or as Churchill said to this one minister, he, would go, he said, yeah, he says you're humble and you have so many reasons to be humble. But anyway, <laughs> he shouldn't have teased those other guys probably like he did at times, but... Um, but really, we have to stay with Christ, stay repentant, stay humble, stay obedient to Christ. If we pass away in Christ, that's a great victory. Like we preached at uh, Ramona's funeral, it really is a great victory. Like, it's sort of like staying covered by a wonderful insurance policy. Let's say if you had a big farm and you had a, a crop insurance policy worth 100000 bucks. If your crop, for whatever, there are a whole bunch of things that can happen to crops. Whatever happens, you got the insurance. Well, it would be stupid of you to cancel your insurance, wouldn't it? Stay under that insurance policy. Stay under Christ. And we've got it made. Never, ever turn back. Um, I didn't. Oh, one more thing I failed to mention. I, well, I it just slipped my eye. It was in my nose. It just slipped my eye. There's one more um, procedure that I didn't say. The man, the strong man who took the goat to the wilderness, when he came back, he had to wash himself outside the camp. That's a big ritual wash and then come in. And then the high priest, after all the stuff he did, he had to take another bath and leave the tunic in the temple and change back to his regular garments. In other words, they had to bathe themselves into being worthy to do it, and then bathe themselves coming out of it. Now you're going to say, what does that mean? Maybe it just shows how, compared to God, how unclean we really are. We need a lot of bathing, uh, spiritual speaking. But Christ didn't need to do all that. Even the guy who took the goat had to bathe himself when he got back because he had just carried Satan to his, uh, his imprisonment. <clears throat> or a goat who represented Satan. So never ever turn back. Hebrews 10.13 There he now waits until God puts his enemies as a footstool under his feet. With one sacrifice then he made perfect forever those who are purified from sin. Hebrews 10.15 And the Holy Spirit also gives us this witness. First he says, this is the covenant that I will make with them in the days in the future, says the Lord. By the way, Paul quotes Jeremiah 31, I think like 31, 31 to 33. So Paul is quoting the uh, Bible, Old Testament. I will put my laws in their hearts. I'll write them in their minds. And then he says, I will not remember their sins, evil deeds any longer. They'll be completely scrubbed, clean. 
Verse 18, so when these have been forgiven, an offering to take away sins is no longer needed. You know, in a way, you can think of it as God carving in our hearts his law. Because isn't that pretty much what he says? Put my law in their hearts and, and burning it into our minds instead of just a stone. Remember Christ in the Olivet Sermon, he made the laws more binding and stronger. You know, he said, hey, if you, um, if you hate somebody, that's almost as bad as murder. And if you're um, looking at your neighbor's wife too much in the wrong way, that's just as bad as adultery. He's putting the spiritual emphasis, and he says to love your enemies. You know, that's really the spiritual emphasis. God wants to put that inside of us. It's the very opposite of what most of the Protestant world says. The law has been done away except those that we decide to bring back. It's the opposite. Um, opposite of canceling the law is what the beast will do. He's going to magnify it inside of us. In my last scripture, um, Hebrews 10, 38 and 39, my righteous people, however, will believe and live. But if any of them turns back, I will not be pleased with them. We are not people who turn back and are lost. Instead, we have faith and are saved. Hold on. Never, ever, never, ever turn back to the world.